Thank you, Daniel. It was a very good talk on basics for NASH. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Will to give our next uh, talk. It's about future therapies of NASH. Uh, and Dr. Holt is currently at California Pacific Medical Center. He's one of the transplant hepatologists. His main interests lie in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And he's actually uh, the director for NAFLD program at CPMC. Uh, it's basically a consortium. It's a multi-center consortium. So hopefully we'll get good outcomes data from that. And he's also the associate program director for transplant hepatology program there. And last but not least, I didn't know that Will also worked as a science teacher, so we'll get to know about that in a bit. So I would like to welcome Will for giving us the next talk. Thank you, Radhika. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to pick up exactly where Danielle left off. You'll see that I overlap maybe by two or three slides. And I'm really going to try to focus on what can we do for these patients. Um, the cynical answer, as you'll see, is not much. But that's not true. And I hope to show you some things that we learned at the liver meeting and that we have from other studies that um, we have now that are very effective. They're not easy, but there's good data on it. So you should at least leave here today knowing what's available now, what can you tell your patients now, and what might be in the future. I, I made, uh, this is my disclosure slide. We have those five clinical trials at CPMC, and I'm involved in one way or another in them. Uh, those drugs are mentioned in a slide at the end, but I'm not making any recommendations about off-label use because you can't access them. And then I changed my title to Present and Future Therapies for NASH uh, because I do have quite a bit of material on some really interesting abstracts of this meeting um, about things that are going on in endoscopic, surgical, and medical. So I move the clock forward a few years. This patient is now 60, um, similar profile to what Dr. described. He lost some weight which was recommended, but his liver enzymes are still not normal. And as I always like to point out, his AST is above 40. So that always catches my attention, and I think it should catch yours too. There's the same fibro scan, there's the same scores, and there's the same interpretation, which is that 14 is right at the cutoff for cirrhosis. Now, incidentally, I have two interesting cases, both in the last year or two, both 60-something-year-old Asian patients. A Asian patients are interesting because they have, the BMI is not predictive the way it would be in other patients, especially Caucasians or Hispanics. And so a lot of the interesting cases, and you know, the ones where you wouldn't expect them to have disease as severe, they, they tend to be older Asian patients. And I think that's because of the PNPLA3 gene, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today. But I've had two. One had a, a, a liver stiffness measurement of 19. So of course I recommend a biopsy. That patient underwent biopsy and had stage zero to one fibrosis. So that's where we have all those confounding variables. Um, that person actually had very, very active per confounding variable. The other one had a score of 24.7. So that's alarming. And so obviously that per person needed a biopsy. But that person interestingly had no stigmata, normal platelets above 200, not just above 150 normal AST to ALT ratio, normal size liver and normal size spleen, and the biopsy showed cirrhosis. So on the one hand, we have all these really useful tools that we can discuss with patients, and I use them, I, I rely on them in my clinic. On the other hand, as I, I think Dr. Bramman pointed out, there's a lot of unknown here. So if you really have a high index of suspicion, you have a couple tests telling you, hey, this could be a patient with fibrosis, um, either biopsy them or don't let them go. And that's sort of echoing what you've already heard. So I think, I don't think we shared the slides. So we independently gave this patient F3. Um, 
And uh, you can see the, the score that I decided this patient was likely to have. NASH with stage three fibrosis. Here's some evidence of bridging here. Um, and so this patient has the real deal. And I, you want to tell the patient that. You want to scare this patient because they are um, often coming into clinic saying, well, is this really a big deal? My doctor just told you to come and s me to come and see you. I don't really even know why I'm here. And so it, this is the one you're looking for. And so the questions are, what do you tell this patient about his disease? I will just spend a couple slides on that. What effective treatments are available right now? Because this patient needs treatment right now. Um, we're not even going to have any um, interim data on any of the NASH clinical trials I'm going to talk about until easel April, 19, April 2019 at the earliest. And I think the, the studies go from April 2019 five years down the road. So, you know, think about hep C eight or nine years ago, maybe 10. That's where we are right now with fatty liver. And then what effective treatments will be available in the future? So um, I try to incorporate these associations into my conversations with, parent, uh, with patients, not parents. And um, I'm just sort of giving you a laundry list here. I'm not going to get into these because Dr. Brandman got into them more. Um, but I'll point out that I bring up, if they're non-diabetic, the risk of diabetes is up to threefold. Um, we've all heard about the risk of cardiovascular disease. It's still the main uh, morbidity, reason for morbidity or mortality in our Chronic kidney disease, there's more and more written about this, and I put an asterisk here because um, Dr. Nguyen actually was an author on that abstract. Um, and then progression to cirrhosis, HCC, risk of liver-related mortality, risk of all-cause mortality. You saw those slides. I bring those up with patients. It's a relevant disease if you have fibrosis. I'm, I'm going to start with sort of the, a bigger picture view here. This is a, a pretty interesting model. I've got two... Um, studies that are, that are models in this talk. So in this one, um, Dr. Yunasi et al., and, and Zobair Yunasi does all kinds of interesting epidemiologic research, but um, this one in particular is designed to estimate the effect or the benefit of treating NASH, period. So the way he approached this was um, he said, we're moving towards pharmacotherapy eventually. It's coming, not next year, but it's coming. And so um, what would it look like to compare a standard of care, which is what we have now, to pharmacotherapy? So he included age cohorts by decade, seven of them. He included 10 disease severity cohorts, and he estimated prevalence in disease progression by literature review. There's, there's data out there that will tell you percentage per year that progress by stage based on characteristics and risk factors. He modeled different, um, he, he created different models based on how much of the population we can treat. Um, you know, fatty liver is a lot like hepatitis C. I would argue even more concerning in that um, a fraction of the, patient, of the patients at risk even know they have disease. Um, with hepatitis C, we have a pretty robust, you heard from Dr. Thoreau earlier, we have a pretty robust um, campaign to identify patients who are infected and treat them, yet we still have half, the half of the infected patients undiagnosed. It's even worse for fatty liver, so it, it's, it's rare that we see um, patients come in with the disease, knowing their stage of the disease who have high risk. He assumed, this is interesting, he assumed two years of fibrosis regression followed by lifetime stability. And so the, the, the conclusions he was able to come to by this model, you know, there, there's no data to check this, but it's just sort of an interesting way to start a talk like this. If you treat 10% and reduce fibrosis progression by 50%, again, that's actually pretty generous considering the data I'll show you later, uh, for a lifetime of effect, then you can prevent 21,000 liver transplants, um, 88,000 liver-related deaths, and gain 661 quality of life years. If you treat half of the patients, again, these are F3 patients, um, again, reduce disease progression by 15% uh, effect over a lifetime. You know, you have five times the effect there with 104,000 liver transplants avoided, uh, 438,000 liver-related deaths avoided, and 3.3 million quality of life years gained. 
He, I have one more slide here. So the, the highest treatment impact was in the, the younger, well, I say younger, but it's, it's really the whole cohort. It's between 30 and 70. But what that does is exclude the very young patients and the very old patients. So you can see here that um, first, the first column here tells you the prevalence that he estimated. And this, th there's data that shows this is the, the case. This is patients with F3. And we think that age is a risk factor. And so this is the prevalence of the disease that we're looking for. In his model, um, those who are able to avoid transplant are the ones who will be coming up on it in the next 10 or 20 years. This is about who we're targeting. And you can see that the, 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 the purple boxes are the ones that w where there was more benefit. And this is how we came up with 30 to 69. Um, so this sort of just demonstrates what he proposed we would be doing if we treated massive numbers of patients with F3 and NASH. I think that the estimates of how many we can identify, how many we can treat, and the, the net effect is a bit optimistic, but it's an interesting model nonetheless. What treatments are available now? Well, disease-specific treatments, there's not much, just crickets. But it does not mean we have nothing. So these are five well-described treatments for NASH. They don't all modify fibrosis. In fact, very little modifies fibrosis, and that's why we don't have a disease-specific treatment. Uh, as you've heard, it's fibrosis that predicts outcomes. But nonetheless, we do have to talk about, and I think that you should either talk about these with your high-risk patients or with their doctors. So this is a uh, matching exercise. A, B, C, D, or E, which of the following is an antioxidant that improved NASH in the Pivens trial versus placebo with a st uh, statistically significant improvement in those who um, had improvement in NASH, A, B, C, D, or E. And I heard a s sound. That was C. Good. Uh, no, number two, uh, this one is a GLP-1 agonist, which improved NASH in a m pretty small study in the Lancet three, two years ago. Improved NASH versus placebo, but did not reduce fibrosis. So number two is a GLP-1 agonist. The only one up there is loraglutide or Victoza. There's now semaglutide or semaglutide, which is in trials for NASH specifically. Uh, number three, this uh, treatment resolved NASH in 85% of subjects. That is unheard of. That's a miracle. And so the answer is a dramatic procedure, and that is weight loss surgery. And I have some new data on that from the meeting, which is interesting. Um, PPAR gamma agonist. We have a PPAR alpha delta agonist in clinical trials. This is the older PPAR gamma agonist, which may cause weight gain, but does appear to improve NASH. And more recently, in a meta-analysis, appears to actually improve fibrosis if you in, in, um, increase your sample size large enough. That PPAR gamma agonist is pioglitazone. And then number five, a macronutrient that has been shown to improve liver fat and liver enzymes, but not much more than that. Um, that is fish oil or omega-3. So the, the, the question really arises, if you're not going to improve fibrosis, what's the point? Well, that's a tough question, because the, the data I'm going to show you say that it, you, you need to improve fibrosis. If you can't do that, you're, you're not changing the outcome of your patient. Plus, they're probably going to have cardiovascular outcomes or complications of diabetes anyway. That said, it's uh, it's, it's not that it's, sorry, to improve fibrosis, is to improve ALT and steatosis is not as hard. And I think there is a role in that, especially when there's positive feedback for your patient. They lose five pounds, their ALT goes down by 20 points. You get a fibro scan two years later and the cap went from 330 to 270. That is useful. And so I may not show you data today that shows that that's an outcome in any trial, but it's clearly benefiting the patient, um, and it's clearly part of disease management. So with that in mind, I'm highlighting an abstract here. It talks about the management of hepatic steatosis with omega-3. Um, it's actually a proprietary compound in NAFLD. And they gave um, 172 subjects who had ultrasound-confirmed steatosis um, three grams a day of EPA DHA versus placebo, and the placebo was a, a similar appearing olive oil pill, um, for 12 weeks. And 
sorry, for 24 weeks, and they took data at week 12 and week 24. Primary outcome was reduction in MRPDFF hepatic fat fraction. You'll see that MRPDFF hepatic fat fraction is um, either a primary or secondary outcome in a lot of these trials, not because it changes your mortality risk, but because it's very tightly linked in the mechanism of NASH. We have to sort of assume that if we can lower fat, that we are moving in the right direction. So in this study, the omega-3 index, which is not a commonly used tool, this is actually a measure of how much omega-3 um, has been incorporated into your liver that improved with omega-3. So that's good. It means that the drug they gave is having some effect. Um, but the real kicker here is twofold. First, in all comers, this intervention did not lower hepatic fat fraction. However, in those with severe, uh, the highest hepatic fat fraction, with severe steatosis, uh, fish oil alone, or it, this isn't fish oil, this is a proprietary um, omega-3 supplement, did lower hepatic fat fraction. So I think the take home here is there is a role for lipid lowering agents and specifically there is a disease role for fish oil in fatty liver. Now this is um, not a hard, hard outcome and you see some of the maneuvering in the, um, po with post hoc analysis here similar to what you would see in some of our um, pharmacotherapy trials uh, because to have a significant effect on this disease is difficult. More about that in a bit. I'm in a, you can tell I'm, I'm working towards pharmacotherapy. So this is another abstract here. Lifestyle intervention in patients with type 2 diabetes aimed to improve glycemic control also reduces hepatic stiffness. So here I'm, using, uh, I'm demonstrating the relevance of FibroScan and the crossover between diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and fatty liver. This was a um, sort of an open-label intervention study of 80 patients at a... Um, I think this was Swedish. You can, maybe I'm just making that up. This was a, I will say, Swedish endocrinology clinic. And this was fairly straightforward. So four days of intensive management. They met with an endocrinologist. They met with a nurse educator. They met with a dietitian. They had a fibro scan that day and three months later. And the effect was significant. Um, at baseline, patients were heavier had worse diabetes control, had higher ALT, and had more liver stiffness. So is it, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, we hear in, from um, referring physicians all the time, well, you know, why should I be sending my patient to do anything? Which is, you know, there's some truth in that. But the answer might lie in this slide. A anytime you can get a patient to address the underlying cause of NASH, there is going to be a benefit. It's just that to actually reach the threshold of fibrosis reduction is much more difficult than this. So I'm using this to show you that if you um, manage metabolic syndrome and work on lifestyle and weight reduction therapy, there is benefit to be had and there's liver specific benefit to be had. Uh, I find this slide very useful. Um, this is a clinics and liver disease review that's now a few years old, but it gives you these specific thresholds of weight loss that can benefit NASH. For example, in the studies that they used in this review, patients who lost at least 3% of their body weight saw a significant improvement, although there's some range, in steatosis. So again, steatosis doesn't change your outcomes, but it is one of our goals. If you lose 5%, a biopsy has shown improvement in ballooning in 41 to 100% of these studies. If you lose 7%, that's sort of the magic number in diabetes and in NASH then you can see resolution of NASH in 64 to 90%, and the magic number for weight loss tends to be 10%. So I use these with patients because we get a lot of patients who weigh 250, 280 pounds, and they're 100 pounds overweight. And if you were to go to the chart on the wall and say, well, you know, to get to a BMI of 25, or if they're Asian, including Filipino, 23, then you have to lose 120 pounds, so lose 120 pounds and come back to me in two years. So that would be the last time that you ever see that patient. Whereas if you can use some of these real you know, evidence-based targets, you can get a patient to have success. If they can lose 3%, your patients can lose 3%. Um, then they can come back, you can show them their ALT, and you can say, all right, let's go for 3% more. So that's my approach, and that's, my, that's the evidence that I use to support it. 
Um, stepping up to a more invasive intervention now. So this is a, th we have an interventional endoscopy program at CPMC that's, you know, multifaceted. But one of the things we've started recently is an endoscopic management of obesity program. We have the balloons and we actually have endoscopic sleeve gastrectomies now. We haven't done a lot, but Rabindra Watson has done several of them, and there's good data on that, which I'm not going to show you today. But this was an AASLD 2018 abstract on intragastric balloon um, in compensated NASH cirrhosis, an observational study. 46 patients, so good size. Um, age 18 to 65, all of them had obesity. Data recorded at uh, month one, three, and six post-endoscopy mean follow-up, almost six months. Um, it was just the abstract, so I wasn't able to get any information from these authors, but they, um, they provided very little baseline data for these patients. However, as we know can happen with significant weight loss, it's interesting to see how this affects fatty liver. None of this is surprising. As you lose more body weight, this is a lot of body weight lost, um, you see not just the expected changes in ALT, uh, but also changes in liver stiffness. So these are, these are deltas here, uh, not absolute numbers. So, you know, a 12-point reduction in your um, fiber scan score is enormous. So we're talking about someone who goes from 28 to 16, presumably still cirrhotic, but um, a, a big reduction nonetheless. And here you see, you know, a CTP point is gained with that much weight loss. So I'm setting the stage here for a little bit more, of, a little more data on bariatric surgery, which really has the strongest data in um, NASH. I think it's worth talking about. But bariatric surgery, in the same vein as MRI, is not accessible to, you know, 60 to 80 million patients with fatty liver, or if you want to narrow that down a little bit, 7 to 15 million patients with NASH and fibrosis. Um, you know, I'll, I'll point out here at the bottom, I didn't mention it, but even the HVPG changed at month six. So again, weight loss works. Um, this is the paper that I use when the patient is contemplating bariatric surgery. This is a French study, a retrospective, 109 patients underwent weight loss surgery over a time period that unfortunately gives you a lot of heter heterogeneity in what surgery they had, including adjustable bands, sleeve gastrectomy, Roux and Y, and even duodenal switch. Um, but I just show this slide to, to demonstrate that if you lose enough weight, you're going to have immense changes, including, I showed you in the, in the matching slide, NASH resolution in 85% and at least one stage of fibrosis reduction in a one-year period of 33.8%. So we don't have any drugs right now that show that kind of benefit. Here you can see in these graphics that the NAFLD activity score um, all the, you know, the, the dark colors are the higher scores, so everybody got lighter. And then the fibrosis stage, likewise, um, improves from before to after. I'll point out, though, that a as we know or as we think, um, cirrhosis is, we don't yet know that we can resolve cirrhosis. That's sort of what's, you know, come back in five years and listen to this talk and we'll see what we have. But right now, I wouldn't tell any patient that their cirrhosis is going to resolve. So a similar and a similarly useful study, this was an abstract here. Um, this actually was also authored by Dr. Tarot, so another, another NCSCG speaker, um, looked at the long-term effect of weight loss surgery in obese patients uh, in a Kaiser cohort in Northern California. So this was a retrospective analysis looking at uh, class two obesity or more who had a liver biopsy, within 90 days of weight loss surgery. So a relatively small group, but they did find 310 patients who'd had the surgery and biopsy, and about three times as many controls. You'll see here that there are some differences between the groups. Those who had medical weight loss, which is the non-surgical group, had more NASH, more fibrosis, and more, more uh, morbidity. And they define morbidity as I documented here, which is basically decompensation. So. Fortunately, there was a, a multivariate analysis done that did adjust for all of these things. And in that analysis, um, those with weight loss surgery still had a significantly lower rate of morbidity, liver-related morbidity over the period of the study. So I think this is data, um, I, sh I showed you, well, this, this is data that um, weight loss 
specifically reduces liver-related outcomes. And I'm going to show you one more study. This was a more recent hepatology paper. This is my second model. So in this model, they hypothesized that weight loss surgery would reduce um, some of the similar outcomes I showed you before. So morbidity, mortality, quality of life years, cost, things like that. Um, they compared in this model no treatment of obesity in patients with F3, in, in, intensive lifestyle intervention, and ruin y gas. They searched the literature for um, data that suggested rates of disease progression for different patients at, with different characteristics at different stages of disease. And then they had corresponding quality of life data for each of those stages. I mean, there's a whole body of literature on quality of life adjusted, quality adjusted life years in different diseases. And of course, there's that data exists in NASH as well. So then they, they uh, calculated the probability of disease progression with and without each of the interventions. So I, I show this slide because I think it's interesting and I think it fits with what we're saying. What they said was that any patient with F3, regardless of their BMI, would benefit from weight loss surgery. Now this is an extreme sort of statement to make, but what I've shown you is that with weight loss, the disease gets better. And so they chose to show it in incremental, incremental cost-effectiveness ratio. And you can see that um, as weight goes up, the ability to show uh, a difference in quality of life and in, in cost savings gets easier. Now, the, the table in the study that I'm not showing you actually includes all stages for all different weights. Um, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to give everyone with NAFLD weight loss surgery. That's obviously ludicrous. But I think it's, that's, uh, that's part of the calculation that they did to arrive at F3 is where we have the most to gain. And that's why I think both Danielle and with F3, because that is who we're looking for. So at this point, um, I'm going to show you what's on the horizon. This is, gonna, this is where I go from non-pharmacologic to pharmacologic agents for NASH. Um, I'm gonna go into a few clinical trials here, but first I wanna talk about the mechanism of this disease. So the older, we can call it the older, some, some would argue it's antiquated, mechanism for NASH, or the, the pathology, the pathophysiology behind NASH is a two-hit hypothesis, and that was you have to get the fat in the liver, and then something has to turn on the inflammation in the liver. So it's evolved a bit, but I still think there's something nice about a simple model, and I, I am going to stick with that a little bit. So um, insulin resistance tends to set the stage for all of these changes. You do still have to have uh, accumulation of lipids or free fatty acids in hepatocytes, and I'll show you that that's a target of many of the new drugs that are coming out. Um, there is something that turns on hepatocellular injury. It's usually closely tied to insulin resistance. There's probably quite a bit of the trigger here that is genetic. In fact, it's been estimated that up to half of the, quote, cause of NASH has to do with the genetic profile, and it's not just the PNP LA3 polymorphism that I mentioned before, but there's a couple of other ones now, and every year at a liver meeting we hear about another one. These are not labs that we can check easily. These are not labs that I recommend patients get if they're really dying to know what they have, but they're there, and it's part of our understanding of this disease process. Um, the last stage here is fibrosis progression, activation of stellate cells, etc. cetera, um, and you'll see that there are a lot of drugs aimed at each of these stages. So the next four slides are an attempt on my part to help you understand the landscape. My goal today is not to give you, you know, a couple of drugs to watch because I don't think we know yet which are gonna be the ones that are the most promising and it's not gonna help you anyway when you're managing patients. But I want you to see how we're going about this. And so on this slide, I've shown you sort of the relevant drugs in development. And I've tried the best I can to arrange them sort of in the right hemisphere of where they act. For example, um, there's a couple of companies making an ACC inhibitor, acetyl-CoA carboxylase. When you inhibit that enzyme, you can't make de novo fatty acids. You decrease free fatty acid accumulation, and you improve NASH. So I'm going to go back to the MRPDFF as an outcome in these studies. Um, if we can reduce liver fat, it's this diagram that 
gives us some confidence that that is an acceptable outcome. Even though it's not fibrosis, if you can show, and we usually do it with MR now, if you can show a reduction in liver fat, that's probably a drug that might have some promise. Um, there are many, many, many mechanisms that lead to fatty acid accumulation. There are many, many, many mechanisms that lead to hepatocellular injury and apoptosis, and there are just as many mechanisms that can lead to fibrosis progression. So one of the themes that I'm, I'm hoping to impart to you today is that this is not going to be a one drug or a one pill once a day disease. Um, I think we're going to have the, the most promise with a drug that incorporates many of these mechanisms. Um, and that has been picked up on by the pharmaceutical industry, and there are a couple of trials that have that now. Again, these are all phase two and three trials. The next two slides, I'm not gonna go into in detail, but I am gonna just point out the reference. So uh, I think there, if, if you really wanna read more about this, there are two outstanding reviews on the pathogenesis of NASH and um, sort of good um, images or cartoons that help us see What's going on? Where are these drugs targeting? And what should we be looking at in the future? So the first one is a Nature Medicine article from this year. And again, you see here insulin resistance. Here is um, fatty acid accumulation. Here is inflammatory cells, inflammatory signals. And here is fibrosis and uh, collagen deposition. So similar to what I've tried to do here, we have a much more professional looking cartoon here that tries to show you where each of these drugs are working. You have, to, you have to have some way to approach this field because there's about 40 drugs in phase two and three trials in the US right now. And it, it's beyond our um, you know, day to day practice to try to understand what's going on. But I do think it's important for you to understand that we are looking at different drugs that target what we know about the pathogenesis of NASH. The other review is a Journal of Hepatology paper same this, this year also. We're all trying to show you that there are metabolic con contributors to NASH, there are inflammatory contributors to NASH, there are fibrotic contributors to NASH. And, and here you see a little bit more of the biochemistry that you either read you know, two months ago or for more of us since medical school or actually pre-med, showing you exactly where all these drugs work. And so I'm gonna bring it back to a slide that I made now because I think there's something that makes sense here. I separated the mechanism of all these drugs into metabolic, so that's targeting insulin resistance or free fatty acid accumulation, targeting inflammation, which includes inflammatory pathways but also apoptosis and cell death, and then specifically targeting collagen formation. Now, if you read the protocol or you know, um, look into some of these phase two and three clinical trials, they'll all tell you that they're all targeting all of these pathways, but they're not all primarily targeting it. For example, if you have a drug, like I mentioned, the ACC inhibitor, where is it? There. So if you have a drug like this, it's primarily targeting free fatty acid accumulation in the liver. If you're successful, you'll have less fat, you'll have less inflammation, and you'll have less fibrosis formation. So a successful drug will touch on all and will have sort of a, 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 a positive p-value in all, but the drugs themselves are actually aimed at different pathways. The top four that I highlighted in green are in phase three trials right now. The next mm, eight, maybe nine, are in phase two trials right now, and then I have a slide on this one at the end, which is in a phase one trial right now, which I really just threw in there because I think it's interesting. Um, but if you look at the way this separates out, I think you see a pattern. So most drugs are either on one side, the red side, or the blue side. More of the drugs that target inflammation are also directly targeting fibrosis formation. And I think this finally helped me to understand how we're gonna put together these regimens of multi, multiple drugs. So you're probably gonna need something that's red and then something that's either blue or green. Now there are drugs, for example, there is a caspase inhibitor here um, that really just has one mechanism. It's it, anti-apoptotic, it's, it's a caspase inhibitor, and a caspase is a single enzyme. So you're not gonna get much reduction in liver fat with a caspase inhibitor. So for example, maybe you pair that with what I, I keep harping on here for, for no, you know, I have no vested interest in it, but um, the inhibitor is, you know, you, you decreased de novo fatty acid synthesis. So a, a drug like this combined with a drug like this 
would make sense, and, uh, and hopefully this diagram helps you understand that. So for the next maybe five minutes, I'm just going to show you some abstracts that I found in I'm going to rehash all of the phase two and three data, or I should say the phase two data, for drugs that are in trial right now. Um, you have resources in Northern California. You have at least three centers that have NASH clinical trials. Um, you've seen speakers. These are all the transplant centers, Stanford, UCSF. So if you have a patient and you want to know about a trial, just contact us. But again, I don't think that the uh, inclusion criteria for these trials are really in uh, the scope of this talk today. So, NGM-282, this is a RAM call, um, and it's an FGF-19 analog, and what we saw at the liver meeting was um, a phase two, let's see if I get that right, yep, a phase two study results. So, FGF-19 previously was tested at three and six milligrams, and this study was to see if it could be given at a lower dose. 38 subjects with NASH, these are, uh, um, for better or for worse, we still have to have biopsy data to get into a study. So these patients had NASH, one component of ballooning inflammation and steatosis, and two in at least one of those. That, that's a very common inclusion criteria with stage one to three on biopsy, and here we go with the MRI again. Um, their endpoint was reduction in fat by the MRI, and you can see here that they showed what they wanted to show which was that one milligram is as good as three milligrams in reducing liver fat. Now there are other things here um, suggesting, for example, that the higher dose improves fibrosis more than the lower dose. Um, but again, as I, I showed, this is, well, it's a one year study. So the, the thing that's nice about this is that this is a company that's been through phase two with a higher dose. It's a drug that has some promise. It's going on to phase three, and now we have information that it could be used at a lower dose. Um, this is sort of the level of excitement that we have about these drugs at this point because we don't have anything approved. So we're looking for um, news that a drug is getting better and better. This is the one that I pointed out that was a phase one trial. This is interesting. I don't, I don't know of any other drugs that are in this class. This is a defined amino acid composition. It's proprietary, so we don't know which amino acids, and we don't really even know what it means to be a DAAC. But the, the background here um, relies on the idea that amino acids interact at almost every level in the, in the pathogenesis of NASH, inflammation, metabolism, fibrosis. And so this company claims that this supplement, it's essentially a supplement of amino acids, interacts in the, in the pathogenesis of NASH in such a way that it affects all the different, um, it affects steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis. And so they gave 24 subjects this compound for 12 weeks to see if it had any effect on fatty liver. So I, I think that it's both exciting that something this simple could work, but also challenging because it didn't do a lot of the things that we were looking for it to do. So in a 12-week human study, we had a significant decrease in liver fat on MRI. So that right there is going to get this drug to a phase two trial. Um, it decreased HOMA IR, so it increased insulin resistance. It, de it increased adiponectin, so that has, um, that's important in insulin resistance and diabetes. And it decreased other markers of liver disease, including Pro-C3 and CK18. In a lot of ways, the Pro-C3 is sort of the new CK18 as far as markers of NASH and developing fibrosis. Um, also, interestingly, when you broke, well, we, we don't know what's in it, but they broke down the amino acid compound into individual components and gave that to rats. So this was 12 humans, but also rats in the study. And the individual components had no effect at all. And so it's not just that they found the right amino acids, but the combination matters as well. So it'd be interesting to hear more about this over the next year or two. Another interesting compound is um, IMM-124E. So this is, a, this is an IgG anti-LPS derived from bovine colostrum. So this is, if you remember the blue and the red, this is going to be inflammatory. This is an immune globulin. So this was a multi-phase um, state phase, multi-center phase 2A study looking at uh, 133 patients over 24 weeks. This is plus placebo. And again, they looked at MRPDFF. The drug was well tolerated. Did, uh, patients did not make antibodies to anti-LPS. Um, but what they found was that only the higher 
dose met any endpoints at all, and only the sicker patients with an ALT above 50 met their endpoint here, and they did not meet their MRPDFF endpoint. So I, I show this to you because it's a new and an interesting um, um, compound, but you know, uh, we'll see about this one. We'll see. And I think I'm coming close to the end here. So, um, uh, you know, I misspoke. The first slide was not a Ramcol because this one's a Ramcol. So this is a 2B, a, a phase 2B trial of a Ramcol. Now, a Ramcol is going to be, it's a sterile CoA desaturase inhibitor. So this is another drug that prevents de novo um, free fatty acids in the liver. So we're thinking not anti-inflammatory, but anti-lipid um, anti here. So it's an oral fatty acid, bile acid conjugated down this reaction, uh, and it decreases biosynthesis of monosaturated fatty acids. This is a large trial over one year, um, placebo controlled, two different doses, and, and you can see how it's divided here. And there's good news and bad news here. Um, they met their endpoint with MR spectroscopy, so that's good. In fact, um, there was a, a significant, a marked, in fact, decrease with a higher dose compared to placebo. Um, they did find that there was NASH, resol uh, NASH resolution with drug compared to placebo, but the p-value was 0.051, so we're, we're sort of slide, as you, as you set the bar higher, it gets harder and harder to show these results. And then unfortunately, they did not meet these endpoints here. Um, they didn't show any improvement in fibrosis with this drug, and they didn't show any change in progression to cirrhosis. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why I showed you these studies, which is that, you know, go back to the bariatric surgery slide that I showed you. Um, huge results, you know, too good to be true. And here we are with drugs that are, you know, barely meeting statistical significance for fibrosis. And as this interesting abs uh, study shows you, um, sorry, I'm gonna, let's skip a bit for time. I didn't put it in there. As this interesting abstract shows you, there's a pretty significant placebo effect in these trials. You know, you put someone in a trial and they're probably gonna eat less, they're probably gonna go to the doctor more, and they're probably gonna exercise a little bit more. So it's very, very difficult to show the data that exists now how these drugs are going to cure this disease. And so that's a, an important message today. And I say that because I really believe that we have to keep <coughs> preaching lifestyle changes and we have to keep helping patients lose weight. But not to be a naysayer, I hope that I've also shown you that there are effects that these drugs are bringing. Combination therapy will hopefully bring more effects. And I think these drugs will be a crucial part of treating this disease. Um, with that, I'll show you my summary slide. We'll stop there so that we can have time for questions. Thank you.